Hi, welcome to my channel and my first video. Considering my channel currently has literally zero subscribers, I thought I'd just make a simple video, it doesn't require a whole lot of effort, so that way I'm not wasting my time on something that probably nobody will ever actually watch. So yeah, thought I'd give a bit of a tour of my home data centre. Um, here we are in my storage room, full of all old computers and junk and other things like that. And you may have noticed that right in the middle we've got something. We've got two 42U server racks. Um, the one on the left is powered off, it doesn't really do a whole lot. It's kind of just like a storage rack for spare servers and things that don't really get used much. But the one on the right, as you can tell by all the lights and the noise, is powered on. That one runs my um, kind of production, if you can call it that, network, home production network. So it's got my um, file server, ESXi server, firewall, router, all that sort of stuff is all in here. So yeah, let's go through that one. Um, now it's a bit dark down there, so I've got this little work light here. I'm going to see if that helps. Hopefully it does. Also, excuse the shaky cam. I know it's annoying, but I am filming this on my phone, which is the only equipment I have. I'll try to keep the shakiness down, but no guarantees. Yeah, so let's get the light turned on. Whoa, how's that? There we go, let's go with that. Alright, so right at the bottom here, actually maybe that's a bit too bright. Try that, okay. So right at the bottom we've got a rack mount UPS. It's a cyber power something or other. Um, not sure what the model is, but uh, as you can see from this LCD on the front, we're currently drawing about 1540 watts, give or take. So all of this stuff is pretty power hungry. Um, also, I should add, I don't normally have all the stuff here turned on. I have actually turned some of it on just for demonstration purposes for the video. Um, the typical base power load of what I run 24-7 is between 8 and 900 watts. So, yeah, like almost half what it's running right now. But yeah, there's that. Um, this big one here, this is my main ESXi server. So it's an HP DL580 Gen 8. Uh, it's got one and a quarter terabytes of RAM. Uh, it's got quad E7 4890 V2Z on CPUs. Uh, those have 15 cores, 30 threads each. So this server has 120 simultaneous threads, which is a pretty crazy number. So even though this server is a good several years old now, um, I think this particular one was actually manufactured in 2015. So it's now 2022. So this is a seven year old server. But even despite that, it's still got some pretty decent hardware, I think. Uh, now the ESXi data store comes over fiber channel from my SAN, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, you might notice it does actually have some internal storage. We've got five drives here, and then a sixth one at the top there. Um, they're all SSDs, but they actually don't really get used a whole lot. The only reason I have those internal drives is so that when I'm taking the sand down for maintenance, uh, what I can do is do a storage vMotion onto this local storage, keep all the VMs running with no downtime, then when the sand comes back up again, do the reverse storage vMotion back off again onto the sand. So, yeah, that way I can keep all my VMs and my um, things actually running. Yeah, I've got about somewhere between 50 and 100 VMs on here. I've got a Splunk server for logging. I've got a Jellyfin server for video streaming. Uh, I've got a PFSense for, um, you know, a router, firewall, DHCP, DNS, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Linux repository with an Ubuntu mirror things for my job. I actually do work on here, believe it or not, as opposed to just fun things for home, uh, and so on. I think I'm just going to move this light a bit, it's in the way. Okay. Alright, yeah, so that's that. A um, little bit higher up, I've got a couple of EMC disk shelves. Now, if you're familiar with these, you may say, hang on a minute, that's not a disk shelf, that's a VNX controller module. Uh, that would be a good guess. It is a bezel from a controller module, that's true. Hence why it has a Xeon sticker and all that sort of stuff. Um, but behind it is just a normal old disk shelf. What I did is I did a little bit of dodgy wiring, which I'll show you in a second, to get this blue light strip running. Um, I want to do that because it looks cool. I like having the, the blue light in here. So yeah, if I can unclip this with one hand, which I'm sure is going to be difficult, but we'll try. I drop it and break it. 
Okay, oh, that's a bright light. Yeah, okay, so see there's some, some uh, dodgy wiring here. So that, these wires go into the light strip, power it, and then the other end of the wire goes, if you can see, it goes between two of the caddies, goes all the way down the back, and then it's actually powered from the interposer board at the back of the caddy. I think it's that one directly to the left of the blue light. Oh, it's painful to look at. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not ideal what I've done, but um, I like the blue light, it looks cool, so... That's what I did. Uh, these are all 2 terabyte drives, 2 terabyte SATA drives, and there's 15 of them. So this shelf has 30 terabytes of raw space. Yeah, so let's see if we can get this bezel back on now, which is even harder than removing it. Almost. Okay, one side on, two sides on. Oh, no, one side on. Okay. Yeah, so that's that shelf, and then the other shelf is a two and a half inch shelf that's got um, that's got SSDs in it. I think they're two five six gigs, and there's twenty five of them. So what's that? About five terabytes of raw space or something. Um, so these two shelves are connected to my file server, which we'll get to in a second. You can just see the bottom bit of it there. Um, they don't really get used a whole lot. They kind of just overflow storage in case I have uh, a need for some extra space um, or some external storage for some reason. I did actually have a plan with this top shelf here. What I was thinking was, oh, if I have 25 SSDs, that's going to be super fast. It's going to be this mega high speed array. Oh, I can run VMs off it and everything. But um, it turned out not to be, uh, not to work in that way. So the problem is, at least I think the problem is, these shelves have a single 6 gigabit link on the back which goes to the server so even though the SSDs are probably a lot uh, even though the SSDs probably have some decent performance to them they're massively bottlenecked by that 6 gigabit link and it really makes them only marginally faster than spinning disks so yeah it didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to anyway above those we have my file server which I was just talking about uh, I'll just see if I can adjust this light a bit, or even turn it off maybe. Mm, that's a bit, that's a bit too dark. Let's leave it on. Angle it up. Okay. All right, file server. So this is an HP DL380E Gen 8. Uh, it's got 192 gigs of RAM. It's got dual E5-2400 series Xeons, and it's got 10 10, ter er, 10, 10 terabyte. SAS hard drives. Uh, these are, I think, the, the um, what do you call it? HGST Ultrastars, or is it WD Ultrastar? Whoever owns that brand name currently. Yeah. So these are configured in a RAID Z2 array, which gives me something like 70 terabytes of usable space. Um, this guy is sharing out storage over SMB, NFS, as well as, like I mentioned, presenting LUNs to other servers over Fiber Channel. Now when I say fiber channel, I'm not talking about FCOE or iSCSI or that sort of thing. I mean real fiber channel running over 8 gigabit fiber channel HBAs. Um, this is something you're not really supposed to be able to do with TrueNAS, but if you manually mess with some of the config files by um, SSHing into the server and not going through the web interface, you can actually get it to work, which is what I've done here. Now directly above that is another HP server. This time it's a DL560 Gen 8. Uh, yeah, I really like these HP servers, if you couldn't tell. Um, this one here has, I think it's 512 gigs of RAM, or maybe it's 384 gigs or something like that. Uh, and it's got quad E5 Xeons. Um, this thing is powered off right now, and in fact it's pretty much always powered off. I don't use it a whole lot. The reason I have it here, it's my backup ESXi server. So this server here, as well as the DL580. They both have the same shared storage on the final SAN. So if I ever want to take the DL580 down for maintenance or you know install updates, whatever, something like that, what I do is I do a V motion from here to here. The VMs keep running with no downtime. Then I can do maintenance on the other one. And then when it comes back, I V motion the VMs back to the DL580 and then I can power this guy off again. So yeah, it's really just a backup that doesn't get used much. And anyone who was actually using the VMs at the time would have no idea that anything actually happens. 
Yeah, so now I'll stand up. Okay, so here we've got a KVM console. Open it up, have a look. Nothing too exciting here, really is just a KVM console. There's the interface for it. Um, it looks nice, I like the design of it with the silver accents and when you close it you get this kind of blue light in the handle, that's kind of nice I guess. It is a bit cheap feeling though, I will admit that. These plastics are really flimsy and yeah. I mean it's going alright so far but I can imagine that one day this plastic's going to start going brittle and cracking. But so far it's been fine. Uh, a little bit higher, maybe I'll see if I can angle the light up. Mm, that didn't really do a whole lot. There we go, okay. So we've got a tape library here. This thing holds eight tapes. We've got four that go in the left, four that go in the right, and it's got an LTO 7 drive. Um, anyone who's familiar with LTO drives will probably be aware that LTO 7 is still fairly decent by today's standards. Um, it's not the latest, they are doing LTO 8 now, and I think LTO 9 is even planned to come out at some point. Um, but these LTO 7 drives are still actually worth thousands of dollars on eBay, they're not cheap. But I got this entire thing, the enclosure, the, the uh, drive, and tapes, it had tapes inside it, got it all for 200 Australian dollars, which is like, what, 35 US cents or something like that. Um, I reckon the seller actually had no idea what they had, because it came from one of these um, liquidation sellers on eBay, you know, those computer liquidation type people, they just sell off old equipment from businesses and stuff. So I reckon what they did, they got it in, they looked at the model number on the front, they said, oh, HP Storage Works 1 slash 8 G2. They searched for that on eBay, they found people selling either empty enclosures or enclosures with really old drives, like LTO 3 or something. And then they said, oh, yeah, it's only worth 200 bucks, whatever, yeah, just get rid of it for 200. Um, yeah, and then I bought it. Now, the only reason I knew it had the LTO 7 drive, which is the reason I bought it, it's because they had a photo around the back, around the other sides. A really blurry, not focused photo. But if you just looked close enough, you could actually see the LTO 7 drive. I was like, yeah, jackpot, I want that. So yeah, that was a crazy deal that I got that. I was really, really pleased with that. Um, yeah, here we have three servers in a VMware vSAN cluster. They're all DL360P Gen 8. They have pretty much identical hardware, same amount of RAM in each, 192 gigs. Um, CPUs are slightly different, but they're all the same kind of family and generation. They're all dual um, E5 2600 Xeons, um, and the hard drives are the same in each of them. So each one has three 900 gig 10K spinning disks, and one 512 gig SSD for cache. So what vSAN does, it combines all 12 of these drives into one data store that all the servers share. So it uses these 900 gig drives for the capacity, and then the SSD is just used for cache, so that when you're transferring data over the network, it goes to the higher speed cache. So it kind of works like RAID in a way, except instead of operating on individual disks, it operates on entire servers. So you can kind of think of it as you've got two servers for storage, and then you've got one server for parity. So then that way, if one of them goes down, you, um, you continue operating and you don't have data loss. Um, this thing's really just a toy. If I want to actually do serious ESXi stuff, obviously I've got a much more powerful server down there. Um, I mainly just set this thing up because I wanted to learn how vSAN worked. I'd never used it before, I had no experience with it. Yeah, the only reason it's actually running right now is just for the video for demonstration purposes. But yeah, there's a little vSAN cluster. Next up, we've got a DL320E Gen 8 V2. This thing is super low end. It's a stretch even to call it a server. It's really more of like a just a desktop in a rack mount case or something. It's got 16 gig of RAM. It's got one E3 Xeon. Doesn't even support SAS hard drives. This here is just a regular SATA drive. And like I said before, excuse the shaky cam. I am trying to avoid it, but it's difficult. Um, I think that drive actually came from an old laptop that I was throwing out. I pulled the hard drive out of the laptop, 
mounted it in this caddy here and uh, yeah there it, there it is. So this server doesn't do a whole lot it's just yeah whatever sits here. And then the last one at the top of this rack is a DL360E Gen 8. Now the hardware in this is believe it or not it's almost identical to the file server this one here the DL380E. Pretty much the only difference is this guy here is 2U and this guy here is 1U. Other than that they're actually identical, like the motherboards are actually interchangeable between them. Uh, yes, yeah, so 192 gigs of RAM, dual E5 Xeons, uh, and what I use this for is controlling the tape library that we saw before. So the hardware is total overkill for that, you don't need dual Xeons and lots of RAM to drive a tape library, but um, yeah, whatever. That's what I use it for. I did actually try to get the tape library working in a VM on the ESXi server, but I just couldn't get it to work. Um, I put the SAS controller from here into the ESXi server, I did a PCI pass through to a VM, um, and the VM saw the controller, it would say, yep, you've got an HP something or other, whatever model it is, all showed up correctly, but it would just never detect the tape library. And it wasn't a tape library specific thing, I even tried connecting those shelves, uh, those EMC disk shelves there, I tried connecting those as well, and it just wouldn't see those either, so some sort of an ESXi issue. Yeah, but that's that rack, um, I'll show you the other rack quickly, there's not too much in there, but we'll just really quickly go through it. So there's that one up, open that one. Okay, so at the top here we've got two servers, which are the same as what we've just seen. There's another DL320E Gen 8 V2, and another DL380E Gen 8. These are powered off, they're not doing anything, they're basically just spares if I need them one day, or backups or something. Another KVM console, the same. A couple of drawers with cables and whatever, bits and pieces. And then at the bottom down here, I'll dim the light a bit, that's a little bit too bright. How's that? Okay, yep, that'll do. Uh, these are really old, obscure servers. Um, they're not plugged in, they don't even have power cables or anything. They're just here for storage to keep them out of the way. Um, everything here is non-x86, so I'll run through what we got. We've got a Sun server with Spark CPUs, that's got Solaris on it. We've got an Apple XServe PowerPC G5. We've got an IBM PowerPC server, that's a... Uh, where's the model number on that? It's an eServer P5, if you can see that. So, similar sort of CPU, except this one runs... Um, you can put things like Debian on it, but I've actually got AIX installed. And then at the bottom we have two Itanium servers, HP Itaniums. This one here is an RX 2620, which is unfortunately broken. Um, pretty sure it needs a new motherboard. I've literally replaced every single part in that, which cost me a lot of money, believe it or not. Um, sorry, every single part except the motherboard, I mean, and it still doesn't work. So, I guess I just got extremely unlucky, and the one part I didn't replace is the one part that was faulty. Uh, I've pretty much given up on that thing. The motherboards cost hundreds of dollars on eBay, which I'm not prepared to pay. So, unless someone was to donate me a motherboard, that thing's never going to be fixed. Um, this one here at the bottom does work, luckily. It's a massive 4U, really heavy thing. It's an RX 3600. Um, I think this has quad titaniums, or it may possibly have dual, dual core CPUs. But yeah, I know that in the OS you have four CPUs showing up at least. Yeah. So, all of this stuff here, they're just toys. Like, I don't use them for actual real things. It's just if I want to... If I want to play with a PowerPC, or I want to play with an Itanium, then here they are, and I can plug them in. Yeah, so that's what's around the front. Let's turn the light off. I'll see if I can go around the back and show you what's there. It's a bit of a tight fit. The only way to get there is this really narrow passageway where I need to walk sideways. Um, let's see if we can get down there and have a look. Whoa. And we got a nice view here, so if you want to look out the window while you're working at the back of the racks, then you've got a window. Okay, so it's pretty hot back here. Um, I don't have any heat extraction or anything, so the heat kind of just builds up and doesn't really go anywhere. The only heat that escapes is what rises up 
vertically towards the ceiling and escapes over the top, which is very limited. Yeah, but anyway, what do we have here? So at the top here we got my fibre channel switches. These are both Brocade 300s. Yes, that one does say HP Storage Works, but as you can see, it's the exact same model. They've just rebadged it. The hardware is identical. Um, I've got these set up as dual redundant meshes. So if one of these switches fails, or if you, you know, rip a cable out, or a cable breaks or something, then it just fails over to the other switch and it keeps working. So this here is how my ESXi servers both talk to the same shared storage on the SAN. Um, I do have a little bit of colour coordination going with the cabling here, so anytime you see purple, it's fibre channel. And anytime you see blue, it's just like a kind of normal Ethernet link to the network switch. So, whoops, sorry. This here is the uh, management port for the switch. Yeah, so there's that. Um, maybe I'll see if I can... How do I turn the torch on? I don't know if I can. Okay, excuse the darkness. Um, I can't do anything about that. This here is a PABX, or a telephone exchange. Um, right now it's only got one thing plugged into it, which means it's not actually doing anything useful. Obviously you need two connections to actually do something with it. What I used to do is I had some of my retro computers that you saw earlier plugged into this, um, and then they could actually dial in and have internet access using a little ISP that I've got running in this rack here. Um, since I set all that up, I have actually physically moved the rack to a different part of the house. Um, it's not really possible to use that setup where the rack is now, unless I was to, you know, run cables through the roof space or something, which maybe one day I might do, but at this point I haven't got around to it. So yeah, for the time being, that's just sitting there, not doing anything much. Uh, now I know you can't really see because it's so dark, but this box here with the red light is a Raspberry Pi. I think it's either a 3 or a 4 or something, not sure what the model is. Um, this talks to the UPS at the bottom of the rack, so if the power is to go out, which actually happens pretty often because power in Australia is really unreliable and really expensive, so when the power goes out um, and when the UPS battery starts getting low, this thing is able to cleanly shut down all the servers in the rack. So instead of just having a hard power off and um, you know, having data corruption and all that, this will cleanly shut it down and then when the power comes back it will all nicely boot up again automatically. Yeah, here's the back of the cluster, a lot of heat comes out of that thing, it's like a furnace. Back of the tape drive. Okay, here are my network switches. So we got one there, cable management arm, and then another one there. These are both micro ticks. This one is a CRS317, which has um, 10 gigabit SFP ports, and this one is a C... what does that say? CSS326, which is all just regular 1 gig um, copper ports. Oh, and you might notice there's a colour here that I didn't say before. These aqua cables are used for switch-to-switch -switch communication. So even though it is still Ethernet, like all the other ones, I just use a different colour to indicate that it's an infrastructure link. Um, yeah, so all my 10 gigabit um, fibre networking. The only thing I use these copper ports for is things like management interfaces and um, other things where fibre just isn't practical. Unless I used a media converter, which I really don't want to do because that's just too messy. Yeah, I'm not sure what more I can say about these. They're just network switches. And the final thing to show here is probably this guy. So this looks like another switch, you probably think it is, but this is for the KVM. So despite the fact that these are RJ45 ports and the cables are blue, um, these are not running Ethernet. Well, actually, maybe they are, I don't know how the protocol works internally. But um, what's on the other end of this cable is, I can show you one here, uh, here. So here's the other end of the cable, it goes into this little HP dongle, and that then goes here as a VGA port, which is... Again, I know it's hard to see, that big blue plug is a VGA port. And then there's a USB plug squeezed in there for power. So this is how the keyboard, video and mouse gets to that console that we looked at earlier. All goes in there and then that switches it out to the to the screen and the keyboard. Uh, and then that's about it, and then just the DL580 at the bottom. 
Yeah, I could show you the other rack. It's honestly, it's just more of the same thing. It's the same thing, but on a smaller scale, so I don't think that's going to be overly exciting. So let's squeeze back around to the other side again. Oh, down the little passageway. Okay. So anyway, that's what my setup here in the data center looks like. Um, as for future plans, I don't really have a whole lot of immediate plans. Um, I may potentially go to 40 gig networking at some point, whether that's with a full, uh, like a full on 40 gig switch, or maybe I'll just have a direct connection between two ESXi servers for faster vMotion. I'm not really too sure yet how I want to do that. Um, and the only other thing I really would like to fix is getting the PFSense off the VM, off the ESXi server, and turning it into a physical host somewhere in the rack. Uh, I mean, it's great having it as a VM when it's all working, like, yeah, consolidation, all that, yeah, fantastic. But when you have a problem, some sort of a networking issue, and you can't connect to it, oh man, it's so painful. Because that thing runs my firewall and my router, so if that VM isn't running, I can't even get to the ESXi server to look at what the problem is. So, yeah, it's just painful when things break, so maybe I'll have a look at that at some point. But anyway, that's it. Yeah, so if you're still here with me, thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Yeah, catch you later.